Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the uh, Back in Business Forum. Um, and thanks to the RDA for organising such a fantastic event. Uh, clearly, the last 12 months have been a, a very interesting period uh, for every sector and industry across the globe. Uh, and any initiative that's designed to give people more confidence or give people ideas and give businesses the opportunity to learn and grow uh, is a fantastic initiative. And it's good to see that this is the first sort of uh, event uh, within our region that we can get people face to face. Um, I'd also like to call out today's National Ag Day, so uh, I'm a bit biased, but given all we do as Agriculture at Rabo Bank, it's a fantastic day to celebrate everything agricultural, uh, the participants in the industry, um, and so uh, happy National Ag Day on behalf of someone within agriculture. Um, and, and it's a nice time to celebrate ag given where the seasonal conditions have returned to over the last sort of 12 months. My name is Toby Mendel, and as, uh, as introduced, I'm the Regional Manager for Central New South Wales at Rabo Bank. Rabobank is a cooperative agricultural specialist bank. 100% uh, of our clients are involved in agriculture, uh, both pre and post farm gate, uh, across all commodities and the, and the full supply chain. Locally, the bulk of our business involves intergenerational family farms. Given that's our space, uh, today's economic update will have a bit of an agricultural flavour. Um, and it'll start with some global detail and look to bring it back to sort of more local issues. The, uh, the, an economic update can be a little bit dry, but does provide, I suppose, the framework for opportunities for growth as we look to see, uh, not only locally, but nationally, as global ec economies begin their recovery. The ag piece does have an influence on the national economy. Uh, it, it is the, the foundation to, uh, a part of the foundation to the economic success, largely predicated on the fact that 65% of our produce is exported. So it plays a key role in the balance of trade for our, our, our country. But also, more importantly, in local regions with the multiplier effect coming into regional communities, uh, a strong ag society uh, and community uh, does provide strength in uh, other services that they need in the local communities and employment through that sector. Within the Central West, agriculture uh, is the fourth largest sector, contributing approximately 10% of both the total employment and output, which equates to about 7,000 people an industry of about $2.6 billion. It also contributes approximately 20% of the Central West export market, so, uh, which is about $1.6 billion of cash that comes into the Central West outside of our region on, on the back of the agricultural produce. So there's been a lot about agriculture. I'll clearly acknowledge agriculture isn't the only and most important sector, and, but it does play a part in association with all the different sectors that you're all involved in. As I said today, I'll provide a high-level overview from a global perspective and look to bring it back to more local factors. But fundamentally, while some global headwinds uh, remain from an economic perspective, I believe, in association, as Reg said, the Central West is well-placed to outperform many other regions and provide continued growth and opportunities for the business sector. Unfortunately, in the current environment, you can't do an economic update without acknowledging the pandemic. Uh, and again, unfortunately, that pandemic is far from over. Whilst Australia has outperformed the globe from a containment perspective, much of the globe, recent developments unfortunately show a deterioration on the back of the second wave, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. So the chart above is charting uh, the, the new cases per week and also the new numbers of deaths per week on a global number. And you can see in the last month uh, unfortunately, the global cases have gone up from about two and a half to four million new cases per week, and global deaths have gone from 30 to 60,000 per week. Whilst there has been some positive news in recent times, only last week Pfizer announced that their initial uh, um, research in their, into their vaccine and the results were going fairly well. The commercialisation and distribution of such vaccines will take time before it has the ability to curb some of the economic impact that we're feeling both nationally and locally. So on the back of that, the pandemic is likely to continue to have a material impact on global economies. And this in turn does an have an a broad impact on the Australian economy, given as I referenced earlier, our national trade balance. Australia runs a trade surplus year to date of approximately $55 billion, which means that the value of exports is greater than our imports, and subsequently our, global, our national economy is somewhat linked to the demand of our international customers. Looking more locally, the pandemic has provided another reason for people and businesses to consider regional areas for their future opportunities and growth. Remote working has become the norm rather than the exception, 
Uh, the lifestyle benefits are recognised now more than ever, and localised health and economic impacts have been limited in comparison to some of our metropolitan peers. That's not to say the pandemic hasn't had a material impact on many businesses, and people have continued to work hard to, to get through that pain. Uh, it is more of a reflection that the future can be bright, and there are further opportunities within regional Australia. From our perspective, the good news is, in relation to the pandemic, is that our key markets are doing better than most. So the chart above is, is uh, that slide is showing daily cases in our key markets. Uh, and as I said, it's been less impactful in key markets such as China, Vietnam, Indonesia and South Korea. The USA and Japan are obviously struggling a little bit more and they're well documented. But clearly, as I alluded to earlier, the other key market for not only agriculture but us is how we're travelling locally within Australia and we have outperformed much of the globe. <coughs> it has had an impact. So the good news is the world economy is improving, but the recovery will be slow. What we've got here is uh, the initial forecast of the global GDP is provided by uh, OECD. The forecast were completed in November last year, so pre-forecast, pre-COVID. And it shows a flatline growth expectation of about 2.5% going forward. The pandemic hit, and what actually happened was that. So instead of growing at 2.5%, the global GDP actually dropped 10% within six months. Um, again, looking for the glass half full scenario, there was a lot of chat around whether it would be a V-shaped recovery or longer. And what this has shown is we have made good inroads globally with half of that loss recovered already. So we're back up to about you know six percent down on where we were pre-pandemic. Locally, the impact has been much less severe. From an output perspective, the Central West is estimated to be down approximately three percent, and employment is down approximately two and a half from pre-pandemic conditions. In the global context, it's left with a greater than ten percent drop. Again, this is uh, a good result for regional Australia and, and the Central West, and potentially positions us for a quicker recovery than other areas. It is also noted that whilst many industries have struggled, uh, back to Reg's point earlier also, a, numbers, a number have continued to trade strongly, particularly locally. Some have pivoted and adjusted their business model to, to create other revenue streams successfully. Uh, and I look forward, there's plenty of those presenters this afternoon who are going to talk to the way they've done that, which should be a great, great knowledge sharing. This is the next stage. Uh, so where do we go from here? So the, the high pink line or the medium pink line is the current forecast from here. And what that shows to us is really we ne we're going to get to the end of 2021 globally before we get to where we were before the pandemic. And that is assuming uh, a pretty major assumption that vaccines are commercialised and distributed through the next 12 months in 2021. So there is some downside of that forecast, uh, but it is an, an overview, I suppose, of, of where the globe is tracking. That's it from a, a, a pandemic perspective, I suppose. The other overlay on that on how Australian economies may grow is how uh, is the economic recovery performance of our key markets. So what this slide shows, and it's a little bit hard to see, but is the expectation on our key trading partners and where their recovery will be. So in simple terms, green is good and red is not so good. Green is showing economies that are going to grow over the 24-month forecast uh, between 20 and 21. You know, the dark green is above 2%, the light green is less than 2%. And the red zones are, are, are still showing a negative growth forecast for the next 12 to 18 months. What this slide does is reiterate the earlier message that our key markets are actually outperforming the globe. So again, China, although there's a lot of noise around China at the moment, and Southeast Asia are all looking to grow in the next two years, and some over greater than 2%. So again, it's another, another indication that potentially Australia has an ability to outperform the globe uh, as far as the recovery from the pandemic goes. It is noted, however, recovery timeframes will also be heavily impacted by government stimulus programs. There are multiple government versions of government stimulus that have been effective uh, in minimising the economic impact of the pandemic. 
In Australia specifically, we've had JobKeeper, JobSeeker, Early Access to Super, amongst a number of other, amongst a number of other, uh, just getting a wind up. There's a lot to go, Steve. Right, eh? Now five minutes to go. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, amongst a number of other options. So, what this graph shows is that within certain demographics, being the middle and low income earners, consumer spend has in fact increased post pandemic. And whilst an unexpected result, it has had an impact on the ability to retain some economic activity in some sectors. The million dollar question is, when that stimulus is removed, what will the impact be? And is the economy strong enough to maintain the, uh, the impetus that the stimulus provided the, the economy at that point in time? The early data is showing that retail spending is holding up. Australian September retail sales were up 7% on the prior year, although they were largely marginally down in the prior month, largely as a result of the Victorian lockdown at that time. But we need more time to analyse the impact of the reduction in government assistance, and that will play out as, as, as those assistances are reduced or amended. So that's a little about the domestic, the domestic demand side, which is going to help drive our economy. Uh, there are some supply shops um, that also help, have helped us, particularly from an agricultural perspective. Uh, for, uh, so in simple terms, you know, um, in China there was the African swine fever, uh, which reduced their pork production by up to 14 million tonnes. Uh, for context, Australia's total protein production, so beef, chicken, pork, lamb, is 4 million tonnes, 4.5 million tonnes. So that provided an opportunity uh, for, we don't have a great pork export market, but we certainly provided a substitute and the beef exports continue to grow to fill that market through that time. The other major shock is the pandemic has closed on the right hand side, um, uh, many processing plants in the States. So again, provide an opportunity for our beef markets. So we've got more buyers for our cattle because there's reduced in pork and we've got less processed uh, product to compete with. Less competition increases demand and helps provide a floor prices to sustain the industry and the economy. So the demand and supply dynamics over the last 12 months have underpinned domestic commodity prices and played into regional economics. This is a chart around uh, global commodity prices. And whilst they have fallen in global term, currency terms, they have not crashed. Uh, cotton, wheat and sugar, the top three lines are largely unaffected, whilst wool and barley are the most under pressure, but not to levels expected at the start of the pandemic. It's important to take that, however, in the context of the local uh, influences that are impacting domestic prices, and domestic prices have actually held up stronger than, than those that's indicated on that chart. Wool was probably the most impacted by a reduction on global apparel demand, where U US retail clothing sales, for example, were down 50% year on year at the start as retail during lockdown. Uh, this has largely recovered to be only down 12%, but the prices have gone pushed up to about 12 bucks a kilo from the lows of eight bucks a kilo, but down from $16 12 months ago. We'll jump quickly to grains. Thankfully, we're looking at a really strong winter crop production this year. New South Wales production will be up about 366% on last year, and nationally, it'll be up about 63%. Uh, typically, this would provide pricing pressure, uh, but this is not eventuated given three main factors. Low domestic inventory levels, um, tough seasonal conditions in the Northern Hemisphere in USA and Russia, and also uh, inventory building across China and Pakistan who are looking to avoid potential food crises and domestic food price inflation. Key issue, I suppose, on the, on the livestock piece is the restocking demands. So, uh, beef cattle prices are uh, at record highs, um, uh, with the, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator pushing $8. Slaughter numbers are down 32% year on year, as prices, uh, which also underpin prices as process supply continues to tighten. We've sort of talked through this a little bit. The only thing on that slide that we haven't really spoken through is uh, the logistical disruption at, run, at home, which may provide some uh, downside risks to the economy. So border closures, uh, transfer of labour, transfer of machinery, transfer of services, goods and skills. Um, uh, we have managed that fairly well. We haven't had the impact at an international level that we expected, and we've managed to actually increase our reputation as far as maintaining a strong supply chain and quality of produce despite the pandemic. Uh, upside and downside risks, obviously uh, resurgence in COVID in Asia could have a material impact. The Chinese trade barriers, again the Chinese government 
deliberately leaked a document last week with 14 grievances against the Australian government. Um, how that's going to play out, who knows? Uh, they certainly have made an impact in the barley, wine, and timber industries for us. Uh, other sectors are still yet to play out, and still a bit of time to understand how vigorously the Chinese are going to defend in their view, uh, their views. So uh, that is no doubt a risk. Um, on the upside, uh, we've talked through that. The only one there is the Aussie dollar. Obviously, a depreciation of Aussie dollar makes us more competitive internationally as well as the relative price of our goods becomes more competitive. We expected the Aussie dollar to depreciate significantly on the back of the pandemic. It did, but it has recovered. So the forecasts for the Aussie dollar are now more stable at north of 70 cents. So we don't anticipate getting that upside of a depreciation of Aussie dollar over the next 12 months. Oops, I've gone one too far. <laughs> Paddy, do you want to talk to my conclusions? <laughs> um, she probably could. Absolutely. We can start hoarding cows. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I don't think you're alone. So the concluding thoughts, um, you know, nationally and locally, the ag industry is well placed to make the most of the opportunities and enjoy a profitable season going forward. The La Nina environment suggests we're going to have a wetter than average summer through into next year, which also positions for strong production metrics throughout the next 12 months. Australia Food and Ag does have a material impact on regional economic performance and consequently we expect better conditions regionally and in the central west, but not only in the back of agriculture but on the back of strong entrepreneurship and a array of strong local and agile businesses across a wide variety of sectors. While some global headwinds remain from an economic perspective, I believe the Central West is well placed to outperform many other regions and provide continued growth and opportunities for all businesses looking to invest in the Central West. Thank you.